And make some improvements as a group. So um, I want to welcome everyone and ask the people that um, that I officially invited to serve on the task group. Um, welcome, Councilmember Parker. Grab a chair and come on up. Uh, we're going to do introductions, and if you'll um, give your name and sort of what uh, what you do and what capacity you're serving in, and remember if you just push the little button when you speak and then turn it back off so that we don't have all the mics on at once. Hopefully we can avoid some reverberation. So um, I, I'll start. I'm Council Member Large. As I said, I worked on some of the initial legislation. Nashville was a bit of a pioneer, and we um, we have learned a lot since we started. What we started with was not at all perfect, um, but we've now got the the, um, the the experience to have made some changes to hopefully have moved it closer to something that's working well and can be a model for other cities. So. I'm, uh, I'm serving as ringleader and uh, information gatherer and hopefully can help us have a good conversation. So let's go that direction. I'm John Dotson. Um, I'm, the, I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Greater Nashville Realtors. I'm the immediate past chairman of the Legislative Committee. Um, I am a non-owner occupied short-term rental owner. Mine is in Woodbine. Uh, and I've been following, obviously, I've had mine since 2016, so I've been following the development of these uh, as a participant. And uh, the Legislative Committee in Greater Nashville Realtors has also participated in uh, the process of trying to develop these, and we appreciate the invitation to be here. My name is George Rowe. I'm the Managing Broker of Compass Real Estate, and I'm the Chair of Greater Nashville Realtors Legislative Committee. My name is Jeff Sheehan. I'm a uh, a non-owner of a, uh, or I'm an owner of a property that could have been a short-term rental, decided to do a long-term rental, and I've lived that next to some really nice long-term rentals and uh, and some short-term rentals also. So here mostly with the with the neighborhood perspective. My name is Britt DePriest. I am the vice president of the historic Germantown Neighborhood Association, and I'm a broker at Compass Real Estate. Uh, hi, I'm Council Member Sean Parker. I represent the 5th District in East Nashville. Uh, I am also the Council's representative on the Short-Term Rental uh, Appeals Board. I'm Marilyn Warren. I have a short-term rental in Wedgwood, Houston. Um, it's an owner-occupied, and I've been there for four years now. So that's really it. Uh, I'm Joey Hargis. I'm the Metropolitan Zoning Administrator. I uh, work for the Codes Department. Uh, I, my, my duties to um, staff in my group enforce the short-term rental ordinance, uh, issue permits, uh, appeals to the short-term rental board or appeals to my decision either to issue a permit or not issue a permit. So I look forward to uh, working with this group. And Hi, my name is Grace Bay. Um, I have an owner-occupied short-term rental in East Nashville, and I also serve on the board of NASTRA um, for the Nashville Area Short-Term Rental um, Representation. Hi, I'm Deborah Volley. I am an East Nashville resident. I own a non-owner-occupied short-term rental in East Nashville. I also used to own two in um, Inglewood that I changed into long-term rentals, and I'm also a realtor on the City Living Group of Village. Great, thank you for that. And I will say we are we are missing a few people um, who will be representing the neighborhood perspective. So um, 
speak all that the much louder for now, Jeff, and I will I will um, assure that that we have those folks at the at the next meeting. So. Um, appreciate everyone being here and, and and I hope that we all do have a perspective but but I'm hoping that we will all also look at this you know for the good of the community is in in all that we do um, just a real quick overview and then I want to offer codes the opportunity um, to speak about their experience with enforcing what we have in place now um, and then my goal is to kind of look at um, items that I've listed that that I'm aware of that we're trying to resolve right now um, and then for us to think through what our method's gonna be um, and to leave here knowing what our goals are for the next meeting and ultimately in hopefully s several very quick and efficient meetings, um, we'll be able to draft um, either a single piece of legislation or um, several pieces of legislation that can deal with the current outstanding issues. So the quick overview is we began this process back in about 2012 when there were 200 short-term rental properties in all of Nashville. Um, and at the time, we had very specific rules for historic bed and breakfast um, that were, that were um, pretty rigorous. And the bed and breakfast owners felt that it was unfair that they had to um, jump through a lot of hoops, including health inspections and commercial kitchens and fire marshal inspections. Um, and then there was this crazy thing that had come out of nowhere that had no regulations whatsoever. Um, so we looked at other cities, uh, tried to figure out what the best practices were. There were not that many models at the time. Um, came up with our first stab at it. Um, it did It did require a permit, which was a good thing. Um, it did have some regulations about how many and where they could be and limits on the non-owner non occupied. Um, but we had no idea this was gonna grow from 200 to 5,000 very quickly. Um, and as everyone knows, um, there are probably a lot that have operated invisibly and, and is wonderful, flexible um, options for hospitality in Nashville and a handful that have been um, very disruptive party houses that have made this a, an ongoing topic of discussion. Um, so our hope is that um, as we have changed the legislation, we, we invited uh, input from the state legislature they have tied our hands in a few ways. Um, everyone is grandfathered in into whatever the rules were when they got their permit. And so we can make changes today, but it will not affect many of the existing um, facilities. Um, and that, that, that has made enforcement become a little bit difficult, but we hope that we can um, create some opportunities just to ensure that the, the bad actors which are the ones that are disrupting our neighborhoods um, can be can be brought into compliance, um, or that you know, there are there are mechanisms for revoking permits for those for those ones that um, are not being good neighbors, um, and we'd like to ensure that that mechanism is more effective than it than it currently is. That's our big overview. Um, again, because state law currently grandfathers everyone into whatever laws are in effect at the time they got their permit, our codes department bless their hearts, has to deal with a different set of rules for almost every single property. And so um, council members, as they learn about issues, have passed rules, um, often three or four in a year, um, and that, that leaves the codes department with this property that's across the street from another one has a different set of rules to play by. So we would like at least for this year um, to try to group things together um, into things that pass at least all at the same time. Um, that's an ambitious goal. It, it may or may not happen, um, but we would, we would like to try to think calmly and comprehensively about what at least what we're aware of now. My hope is that a lot of stuff will, will have an easy resolution and we can group all of that into a single omnibus bill. It's possible one or two things are so sticky that we may pull them out, um, but continue to try to keep them tracking so that ultimately what we can codes is only one new set of rules to deal with um, for, the, for this year. Um, we, can't, we can't undo what's happened in the past, but we can try to be a little bit more methodical about it currently. So um, y'all are, are representing uh, a lot of people who care deeply about this. So, um, so I hope you will take your task seriously and work with me on, on uh, finding good solutions. So with that, um, two, two questions. I wanna um, thank the people that are here participating um, I do want to um, 
offer uh, at least a mechanism for public participation. What we have done successfully in meetings like this is have note cards uh, where people can fill out questions and bring those to Roseanne Hayes, who's sitting in the corner and has helped facilitate all the details for this. So if there are people who have questions, if you'll write them on the note cards that are back at the sign-in table and hand them to, to Roseanne, she'll bring those up to me and we'll try to incorporate them into the meeting because we appreciate y'all being there, being here. Um, so if, if people are comfortable with that mechanism, I would offer that as, as our way to invite public participation. I'm seeing heads nodding, so that's great, thank you. Um, next then, I would like to offer Mr. Joey Hargis from CODES the opportunity to, um, to kind of very briefly give us an overview of, of things that y'all are dealing with right now that we may be able to help y'all with legislatively so that you can do your job more effectively. Great, thank, thank you, Council Member Allen. Um, my, again, my name is Joey Hargis, I'm the Zoning Administrator we currently have a staff of five that enforce the short-term rental regulations, and this staff of five um, consists principally of, of two areas. One is the enforcement mechanism, uh, the other is the permit issuance mechanism. With me uh, tonight in the audience, and I may may have uh, Mr. McBroom join us as Nick McBroom, the, the new short-term rental uh, chief for that section, to, to fill in blanks I may leave out of this report. So, uh, But to give you a, an overview uh, Councilmember Allen talked about changes to this code, and, and the legislature was clear that um, we are to enforce the rules at the time the permit was issued. So any of the changes that come forth, we're currently on version, I believe, 9 or 10 of this ordinance. So my staff has 10 sets of rules to enforce on the approximately 5,000 permits in this county at varying degrees of depending on when that permit was issued. Uh, but currently, just to give you some numbers, uh, we've issued approximately 5,400 permits in the county. Uh, there are 4,950 uh, active units that we have. There have been 255 new short-term rental units come online in the last 30 days. Um, the good news, uh, at least from the standpoint of a compliance issue, we're averaging between 95 and 98 percent compliance with the regulations here in Nashville. Uh, based on the reports we run from our host compliance or our, uh, enforcement uh, entity we use to, to keep track of violations and stuff. So on the whole, the problems that do occur, they may seem to be uh, the large subset. They are really the, the vast minority of, of the issues that go on in the county. Uh, we generally have really good compliance on the ones that we have issued. Uh, some of the issues that w we run into, uh, frankly, are the, the issues when we're talking of owner-occupied permits or those where the allegation is the owner doesn't reside on the premises. Uh, that's, that's the leading allegation that comes up. And, and we handle that uh, twofold. It, me being the new, new zoning administrator here, I've changed some, some processes in the office to develop a, a test which is actually uh, based off a 1916 uh, Supreme Court case here in the state of Tennessee dealing with domicile. Yeah, it, <clears throat> not to bore the non-lawyers here, but uh, the case dealt with at the time the state of Tennessee tax folks on personal property. And it, and it dealt a little bit with a farmer who lived in uh, Trousdale County that moved to Sumner County. So he's getting taxed in two counties and uh, uh, refused to pay taxes. But it came down to where does, where does, this, where does this person live? Uh, and so the, the gist of this case basically turns out that, that you can have multiple residences, but you can only have one domicile. So when we're talking of owner-occupied, this has to be, and our ordinance requires that this be their, their principal residence. They permanently reside on the premises. Um, we occasionally get the ones, well, yes, I live here, you know, a few days a week, and I live there. We're into, they're gonna make a choice at some point. It's either this permit's valid, <coughs> or we're revoking the, the permit application that you've applied for. So that's the standard for us. There's only one in the owner-occupied situation. So it's your principal residence that comes in that. Um, you know, besides the, the noise complaints and the, um, I guess, Mac, the, the overcrowding or too many folks, uh, too many bedrooms, um, are, are generally the most frequent complaints that we get for, for those um, types of permits when we're dealing with owner-occupied. Uh, the non-owner-occupied, the largest issue I think we have that, that comes up are ownership changes that occur through the process, this LLC owned it, they sold it to another entity. Um, and that 
entity continued to operate without the permit. Uh, the state law says that, that you're vested in the time that the permit is issued, but that uh, terminates upon a change of ownership um, or transfer of the property. So um, in instances there, we have to look at each transaction to see is this, is this truly a change of entity? Uh, you know, did the parties change? So some, some flexibility, one of the things we've asked for in, in, in an amendment to at least give, give me some flexibility to, to make a call. If it's, uh, I, I saw an instance where we had a non-owner occupied LLC and it was a husband and wife and they refinanced their house, taking advantage of the low interest rates at the time, uh, put, the, put the property back in their names individually because the lender would not lend to the LLC, uh, did that and then subsequently rolled it back to the LLC, but we did not, we didn't notice that change until they applied for a renewal. Uh, that case, in my mind, the, the statute talks about a transfer. I don't really see that as a transfer. It's still the same parties, nothing really changed other than the finance, but uh, the situation I've got in this ordinance, I've, I've got to hold that that's a, that's a change of ownership. I think some flexibility to give, to, to give our department some ability to, to make some judgment calls, which are appealable to the short-term rental board uh, that Councilman Parker sits on. Uh, determinations from, <coughs> excuse me, the, the zoning administrator's interpretation like we do with the Board of Zoning Appeals you know, has that. Because as you all know, this, this section resided in, in Chapter 17, which, which I as zoning administrator enforced and was moved to Chapter 6. Um, and, and kind of related to that, I guess, is to provide the Coast Department some enforcement ability. In Chapter 17, if there are violations of the zoning ordinance, uh, I have the ability as any administrator to uh, curtail services to a property. Uh, typically, those, that's water service to a property. Uh, this, this move to Chapter 6, I no longer have that authority for these bad actors who are constantly, uh, you know, maybe continuing to operate without a permit or violating uh, court orders because they're out of town. I can't get them served uh, to, to come to court here. Uh, so perhaps in this ordinance, one of the things we'd recommend is, is adding um, that language back to the chapter six section uh, to, to give the zoning administrator the ability to, uh, through the coast department, to protect curtail services to a property. Um, from the standpoint, if, if we can have the parties going down there, I think these folks would be less inclined to, to rent a house if I can't shower and I can't uh, bathe and that sort of thing. So I think as a deterrent mechanism, uh, again, not something that would be used uh, heavy handedly but uh, done so in the, in the worst instances where I just, I can't get compliance from them any other way. I can't serve them, they're not, they're not residents of Tennessee, I can't go get them and bring them to court. Uh, but the ability to do so I think would be helpful uh, to do that. Uh, one of the other changes that, that we recommend to, to the group is to, you know, the current ordinance lists out items and documents that you need to submit for short-term rental. Um, We've talked about in, in our office maybe creating a type of tiered system of those documents, maybe giving some more weight or credence to documents. Um, bank statements, in my mind, are, are pretty thin. You can contact your bank and change the address all day long. Uh, driver's licenses probably have a little more weight. Voter registration cards clearly have more weight. Um, if you're moving your voter registration card from property to property, you know, you may be violating state and federal laws if you're not at your principal residence uh, and, and you claim you live here, but your voter registration, you're over here voting in Donaldson, let's say, but you're claiming I live in Bellevue. Um, you know, there's some ability perhaps to turn you over to the district attorney, uh, but at least it proves some ownership. So I think some type of tiered system to give some documents more weight than others, maybe provide us one or two of these and maybe three or four of the other, the, the electric bill, the, the water statement, the, the bank statement. Because uh, as of right now, I was written, it's any two. And uh, in, in my tenure here, I've, I've tried to take more of a um, more of an approach of, you know, this, this applicant submitted five documents, two show them at the property, but three did not. You know, I'm looking at um, insurance records that list a mailing address in another county. Uh, I'm, I've been more inclined to deny those permits uh, coming on and, and allow them to appeal that to the, to the board uh, rather than just, oh, you've checked you know, you check the box, here's two that you provided, let's issue it. Uh, so we're doing, we're trying to do a better job of, of uh, taking a more uh, in-depth approach at looking at these applications. Um, 
uh, one of the suggestions I think that we had too was um, in, in the notification process where new applicants are sending out letters to owners adjoining properties, may give them some ability, uh, those neighbors to file something with my office, you know, within 15, 30 days of that notice, you know, to, to say, hey, this, this person doesn't live here. This, you know, give us some type of, um, at least something to, to look at um, from the standpoint of, but I think we need to be fair with it too, where we don't delay the process further uh, by maybe perhaps allowing a, a neighbor sort of drag out that process. Maybe a window that, that at least we can get some evidence that, oh, they clearly don't live here, you know, based on what was submitted. That would be helpful to us, but um, I think that's that's the, the, the large summary of, of, of suggested changes that, that I have that would help us enforce enforce the ordinance uh, to now look over to Mac. Is there anything you think, Mac, that I might have left out or any issues that you see? I'm happy to please come forward and take my, take my seat. Yes, my name is Mac McBroom. I am the uh, short-term rental chief. Um, just, uh, he's given you a very good overview, but I just want to flesh out one or two items. One thing is that we've just had a um, a limitation placed on uh, the zoning districts in which uh, not owner occupied permits may be issued going forward. And th that took place on January the 1st of this year. Um, and so we saw there the potential for uh, a greater issue with fraudulent, um, you're trying to obtain owner occupied permits in a fraudulent manner. Um, and so, therefore, we were asking the council to give us some um, some help on that in terms of uh, making the owner-occupied permit uh, application uh, a little bit more detailed in terms of uh, that information uh, that proves resident. Um, and so, um, that will, will be a, a, a very big thing. Uh, another thing is that we have had lots of complaints. Uh, if, I'm sure most of you have noticed if you drive around town that um, uh, a very favorite type of building that has been constructed for short-term rentals, is, or they call them the tall skinnies, but it's, um, they have been in zones previously. Going forward from January 1st, um, most of that will be eliminated, but the existing <coughs> permits, as long as they continue to renew, they'll be legal. Um, th they build um, rooftop decks, which has been an issue because you have residences just across the street that uh, it has caused an issue. And so the the problem is that we really don't have the, the, the ordinance, uh, the Metro Code says that noise complaints are handled by the Metro Police Department. Now we can send them a notice of violation, but really it has no punch. It, uh, but um, in any event, thankfully, uh, going forward, those, uh, the uh, not owner occupied permits will be restricted to zones where that sh potentially should not be such such an issue. How, how is that the case? You said it's going to be restricted to zones where that's not an issue. It's uh, as of January 1st, there are no longer, um, uh, you can no longer obtain not owner occupied permit in a residentially zoned district. They're no longer available there. And the, the listing of zonings, which is available on the website, um, that where they now are available, uh, lend themselves to being uh, not as residential in nature. <coughs> and so, uh, therefore, the, the, the same activity may take place, but it will be less problematic. From the standpoint of what Mac's talking about, uh, these are the RM zone districts. RM is residential multifamily. multifamily. And, and there are many of these zone districts that uh, um, are on these 50 by 150 lots scattered about East Nashville, Strong's district, district five has many of them um, where you've got RM zone and immediately beside it RS and immediately beside it, you know, two family zoning. Um, so these going forward will not be issues, but those that, that filed their application prior to the first of uh, December 31st and had a valid use and occupancy permit uh, those are we've got a we've got and I don't have an exact number we've got a, a sizable portion of those that that apply that we're still working through so you may see uh, uh, some more of those units coming online but 
they, they had their had their application and had a final UNO uh, for those. We advised folks to get the application in. We would look at the UNO status of the permit as of the 30th of, of December if they don't have it by October. Mac, you mentioned you wanted to uh, see a more thorough application. What kind of additional questions or information do you want collected from those? Well, um, the, the list of questions that we submitted for the council's consideration included uh, other residential properties that you own, uh, own um, uh, your place of employment and the uh, principal place where you conduct business, um, where you register to vote, vehicle registration. <coughs> And uh, one other point that I'd like to add, um, uh, Joy was talking about um, the um, switch in ownership. And, you know, it's not Metro's intention uh, to hold people hostage to keep them from being able to refinance a property. But the way the ordinance is written currently, it's, we can't, we don't really have the administrative leeway. And so uh, anything that can be added along that line, <coughs> however, I think that it would be a good idea to have <coughs> a time limit placed on it because the permit, the name uh, <coughs> to whom the permit was issued is the one that in which it needs to remain. So if it's switched out, there needs to be a, a time limit as to when they have to have it back. And we were thinking uh, 30 days from the day that the, uh, uh, that the uh, transaction is completed with your financial institution. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, that that's a good overview. And and, and I've got um, kind of under current items. If y'all are looking at the agenda, um, many of those are the things that that Joey and Mac have brought up already. The enforcement of out of town owners, um, I think, is where Joey's referred to the ability to curtail services as an uh, a mechanism that they think could be could be very effective there. Um, and then the uh, item E, refining mechanisms for pr proving owner occupancy. Um, so those two are the, the ones that they focused on the most. Um, so what I'd like to do in the half hour that we have remaining, so we can use our time very effectively, um, is I'm gonna run through these real, real quickly. Um, and then I'd, I'd love to kind of hear from the group on, on your thoughts on um, how most effectively we can proceed with um, drafting legislation and getting getting back to our communities um, because I, I want my goal is for folks to feel like all the all the stakeholders have had some input in this so that when it does get before the council it's it's not a surprise to anybody that that all the all the people that have been watching this closely for the past four years um, you know, are aware that we're working on problem solving and I think everybody wants the problems solved. So if we can, you know, if we can do that communicating back to our um, communities, I think that would set the stage for, for that. Um, and then to um, just kind of set out our roadmap for, for how we wanna, how we wanna do that. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go through these six, seven, eight items uh, and maybe add a couple more and see if there are other items other people think should be on this list um, and then invite a conversation for um, how we want to move forward dealing with those items. Does that seem like a good good process? Okay, so first is the enforcement for out-of-town owners. Um, the suggestion has been made to, to look at adding language in the Chapter 6, Division 6, Section 6, whatever it is, that would that would give you that authority again. Is that is that correct, Mr. Harvest? That's right, Mr. Councilmember, that the the section now that we've got, it's um, 174630, uh, and I'll, I'll save that to your reading, but th it, it would be a good template to use okay. uh, in Title VI. Great, okay, 4630. Any, any other comments on on that? I was just Jeff? curious, the, when we talk about not being able to successfully summon out-of-towners to environmental court, is that a is that a matter of jurisdiction? Is that a matter of practically not being able to affect good service on someone who happens to be in uh, Denver? Or e exactly what's the issue with it, it's using both, courts? It's both. Uh, from an enforcement standpoint, uh, I mean, obviously Davidson County, we use the Davidson County Sheriff to serve. Um, those out-of-town those out of town um, violators, uh, the one that comes to mind, and again, I can't 
same names, but it's, it, you know, there's just, there's no ability to have them serve outside Davidson County or outside of Tennessee successful to do that for, um, and, and, and if we do get them served, they don't come, you know, that there's no ability to, you know, I could, I could get, uh, finding of contempt of court, uh, civil contempt, but, you know, an, an, or even a body attachment to, to take them under arrest, but uh, unless they're in this jurisdiction, there's no, there's no ability to go get those folks and, and, and bring them back um, to that. So that's the, the thought of if they continue to operate and continue to, to, to violate our law, that there's some means of, you know, and, and the thought is curtailing water services to that property is, is, is probably the best way and safest way uh, to do that, um, so if they continue to, we have these parties or, or these renters uh, coming in there. I think that's going to that's going to, no pun intended, dry up quickly. Uh, <laughs> if 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 those uh, folks are unable to bathe and and use the property as they thought, uh, may have the effect of you know, sort of those those clients going after the the operator, uh, maybe in a civil manner to do that. Is is it possible to have some sort of idea? How often does that? Um, present itself as a problem for the coast department. I, I would say I would say uh, as a pr it's quite low, but we do have we do have several uh, and less than than four or five in the county that, that do this that we know they're out of town and, and that's their s sort of mo modus operandi. They're they're just not they're not going to follow this law. Uh, they're going to continue to operate in, in a manner of, 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 of doing it this way. Okay. So you know. Like I said, I mean, the compliance part, we're, we're 95 to 98%. Right. We're talking about that small percentage of folks, but it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a small subset. But we just don't have any tools to, to, to do that where I do in chapter, in the zoning code, uh, if someone's violating it. And that process could include notification ahead of time, this is, this is what's coming, yeah. here's, the, here's the timing, and, and here are your options. That's correct. This, this, I mean, this is a process where we've already abated them. We've, 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 we're taking, we're in the court process to get this now. And it's just, you know, the judges, you know, just don't have the ability to go get these folks and, and bring them back. So another tool. Okay, I think, uh, good, good question, Mr. Dotson. So I, I know that um, to a large extent that our ability to assess any kind of uh, penalties lies in the hands of our friends on the Hill, the state legislature, but what is the process right now for revoking somebody's permit? The, the, uh, the current revocation process is it, if we if we've you know collected enough data to say yes they're in violation of the permit we write the the owner of record uh, a, a certified letter saying you know this permit is revoked you've got you know so many days to cease operation we have to give them the ability uh, if they don't do that then we abate them through the environmental court process and, and that's that's the process. By and state law says that they have to exhaust every appeal, correct? They, you generally have to burn your administrative remedies first. Uh, to, to that effect. So, and, and, and yeah, could uh, uh, our director say, uh, Mr. Uh, Herbert? Yeah. If you'll introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Bill Herbert. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm Bill Herbert. I'm the director of codes. So, uh, the state legislature has stepped in and said that. For us to be able to revoke a permit that was validly issued for a bad act, that the act would have to be an act that violated um, general law and not an act that specifically violated the short-term rental law. So it can't be something related to, well, they didn't get their permit right or anything like that. It'd have to be a general law like disrupting the peace or uh, drunken and disorderly conduct, something like that. So then what the state has said is, we have to then prove that through court. We have to do that, and, they, and then uh, for each case, for the case, there has to be a separate case for each violation, and then each case has to exhaust its appeals all the way through. We would start in um, general sessions or environmental court from there, or it could maybe even start in criminal court, depending on if the DA is involved. In any event, it would have to exhaust all available appeals all the way up through the Tennessee Supreme Court, if that's as far as it went, and then we have to do that three times. If we do that three times, then under state law, we can then revoke the permit. It's a virtually impossible burden of proof. So our goal is to encourage owners to be good 
good neighbors and behave well and perhaps the curtailment will will get their attention better than this legislative process. Um, I think we could talk about that a lot. Let's try to get through um, the others and then we'll, then we'll think about that. So um, item B is an existing bill that's, um, that's been deferred um, for a number of months that um, actually this one is not currently on the, the, um, on the council agenda. There was a distance requirement um, that was passed that said non-owner occupied had to be at least 100 feet away um, from churches, schools, and several other entities that we, we, I mean, we have that for a number of other things like cash checking and check cashing and, um, um, and selling beer. Um, when, we, when we rearranged things and moved things from set Division 17 to Division 6, that got lost in the process. So um, there is a um, request to put that distance requirement back in that would say that. So I, I throw that one out there, not for general discussion tonight, but just so people will be aware that that's, that's a topic that I would like for us to, um, to discuss again as we're, as we're doing this. Um, there is a bill, 2021831 that has been deferred for at least nine months now, I think, that requires um, parking similar to what hotels are required to have as opposed to parking similar to what residential properties are required to have. Um, and uh, that has, I know, been viewed by um, the owner community as onerous um, for the neighbors who have ended up on a party weekend having cars up and down their street. They feel like that's a good protection. So um, I don't have the answer to that one, but I, I'm hoping this group can, can think through um, how, we can, how we can provide some relief to people that have ended up, you know, bearing the burden of when extra parking is needed, they ended up parking in their yard or their driveway or whatever. Um, and is the solution then to have front yards become totally paved? Um, I'm not sure. So um, that's, that, is, that bill is currently written and it's 831 if you wanna look at what it requires. I will point out it, it simply refers um, this, this parking back to um, a somewhat complicated parking table and if you look at that parking table, it says, you know, hotels need one parking space for every room. Um, but then at the bottom, there are all these exceptions and ways that you can lower that, and that applies to this. So it's not quite as straightforward as it looks. That being said, I would, I would invite y'all to, to study that and the parking table, and I'll send you the links to that so that you can know. That has been deferred until July to give us time to do our work. Um, so I'm, I'm asking for creative solutions there. Um, item D is complaints for multifamily properties. Um, this is an interesting one because if uh, someone lives next door to an eight condo unit that now has eight different short-term rental permits owned by eight different owners, and on Friday night they hear a loud party, amplified music is a general metro regulation um, that, that is, is, is regulated, so that is something that could be considered a valid um, violation of the code. If you can hear amplified music at the property line, then that is a violation of Metro code. However, if there are eight units and you can't tell which one it's coming from, how do we, how do we complain about that? How do, we, how do we get that owner to ensure that their, um, their tenants are behaving, their guests are behaving? There is technology out there that can be that can be installed, that will warn an owner if they care. How do we make the owners care? Um, so that's that's the challenge I throw out there um, because I, I know that, you know that is an issue that is making um, some neighbors have to deal with unpleasant conditions on a on a regular basis, and that's what we want to to put an end to. Um, item E: refining mechanisms for pruning proving. Um, owner occupancy, we've had some good suggestions made there, so I think just beginning to draft that legislation and have you guys make other suggestions is um, pretty straightforward. Um, item F, are we obligated to issue permits to owners of known problem properties? If they fill out a new permit application for a new property and they've done everything properly, but you know as a matter of fact that they are a problem owner, 
is there a mechanism for not uh, giving them that permit? And Mr. Hargis, I'll let you tell me where we are on that so we know if. Uh, from, from the standpoint of, you know, I don't think currently we have any, uh, any ability to do so now. Um, of course, we're, th this should only be affecting non-owner occupied. Uh, you know, in this Could, situation, exactly. Um, so it, it would be it would be those as, as the director talked about. If it's if it's a violation of some general requirement, it, it's virtually impossible to, to revoke that. I, I think from the standpoint of are we compelled to issue it? I, I think we are. If they if they if they supply what's required by the ordinance, uh, and there's not evidence that's submitted to the contrary, which which we can currently not issue the permit and appeal it. Uh, but I think I think we're going to be required. So currently as it's written. Yes. So my question to this group would be, does that seem like a reasonable change that we would want you to give you, to give codes a tool um, if they can document, you know, you're, you're this owner and we've got the, you know, the multiple complaints against you and, and, and the law now says, you know, that we're, um, we have the right to not issue new permits until all those other ones are resolved or something. Is that technically something we could do? Think on that. Okay. Everybody think on that. Oops, I see Mr. Herbert thinking. <laughs> Tell us what's on your mind, Mr. Herbert. So sorry. Um, so the reason that Joey is hesitating because we're both lawyers and there's a general proposition of law that you really can't hold one bad property hostage when another property doesn't have any problems associated with it and everything's being done correctly. Now, that being said, there is a current metro ordinance that allows us to do just that. And so when we have, not with short-term rental, but with building code properties and building code violations and, and, uh, and property type violations, high grass and weeds and stuff, we utilize it. So until a court tells mm -hmm. us no, we're continuing to do it and we've been successful using it for a number of years. So for what it's worth, there's a model for that out there um, that's that's currently enacted in the Metro Code. Good to know. That we've right. used effectively. We'll look to y'all for guidance on doing that correctly then. Um, item G, I just I just wrote this one down. Uh, again, it is a it is a very rare occurrence that something comes up where something illegal and really bad happens at a short term rental. Um, it, it may even be at, at the same rate as they happen in, in other homes. But when that when that happens right now, we have currently never asked short-term rental owners to keep track of who's staying in their in their properties um and uh, hotels you know can tell you who was there so is is that a reasonable is that something while we're at it do we want to add just asking people to keep a registry of who stayed there um and their driver's license number or something Marilyn, i, I just want to say that that's it's almost impossible to do unless you have airbnb who keeps track of everybody that stays there and you can just print it out. Because even when I owned a bed and breakfast over on Blair Boulevard back in the 90s and the early 2000s, when they would and they wouldn't, even though they, you know, it, they, even though famous people stayed there. I mm. mean, they would or they wouldn't. So it's not, I mean, you know, unless <laughs> you stand over them and say, sign in, that's not gonna happen. But if you have, if you have information on their booking, then you can kind of follow up with with all of that. Gotcha. It's just an Air Airbnb. Just you can just print it out. Whoever stayed there, you don't get paid if they don't stay. So there's a you know regulation. Okay, so we may have to work with the I don't know anything about how everybody else books, but that's that's how that's done. Thank you. That's that's helpful information. And and again, that's that's not something that anyone has asked for at this point. I just I just was wondering while we're at it. Well, you can ask. We can ask, that's exactly <laughs> right. Um, I've added two more items and then I'll uh, open it up to other folks to say if you've thought of other things. Um, Mr. Herbert, you and I have talked a couple of times about if Nashville has gotten to the point of having enough things happening at night and on weekends that we need a flex code enforcement team that is out, even if it's just once a month or something, um, to enforce things nights and weekends. Um, and that's not necessarily, I, not, might not get spelled out in legislation, but I mean, while we're talking about helping y'all enforce things better, is is this an appropriate uh, platform for us to have that discussion? 
Thank you for the musical chairs. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, um, because I think ultimately it speaks to this department's need for more staff. Mm -hmm. um, so we get constantly asked to do certain things at night and um, we don't work at night. My inspectors don't work at night. We don't have the staff to work at night. So um, if that's contemplated, then we would need to, to be able to staff it up to be able to do that. So yes, thank you. Okay, let's have a budget discussion about that. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, and then the, the final item that I have is something that's, that's come up several times and that is with regard to ownership change. Um, and my question is, can we build in uh, the flexibility to give you, I guess the ability to, I mean, y'all have y'all have given two instances where someone in good faith made a, a, a legal change and it and it um, may have caused them to lose an investment they had counted on. I would ask if that can also work in the other direction. Currently, the language says there can't be an ownership change. Um, I know for a fact that you're not going to go through all five thousand and check those on a regular basis. But in the case, again, of problem properties, can that be used as a tool um, if you discover in the process that this out-of-town owner has also, within their um, structure of however they're owning this property, made a change? Does that give, as we've set it up, have we, have we given you a tool, again, where you could um, put, either revoke their permit or, or acknowledge that they have lost their vesting in that permit. And, and is that already built in or, or do we need to do anything uh, to give you that tool? I think, I think that's built in. Bill, you may, uh, I've, I've been here a year or so, uh, at least back during, for this term. Let me turn that back to you. Yeah, jo Joey is, is, is new. I was the previous zoning administrator. So what Berkeley, as you know, and y'all may not know, we've, been at this since day one. Yep. So um, honestly, I think it's already built in because short-term rental permits have to be renewed annually. And when they are renewed, I know Mac and his team are checking for the ownership to make sure that the requested new permit, that the ownership has not changed since the previously issued permit. So I think it's kind of already baked into the system. Okay, good, good to know. And a suggestion was made by someone on this group, and I, I apologize, I can't remember who, that again, Every year when we when the permit is renewed, currently we ask the owners to sign an affidavit saying nothing has changed. Do we ask them to, or can we ask them to, on an annual basis, supply their ownership proof documents every single year? I think that can be. I think that can be done. Um, it, obviously, it helps if it's legislative, you know, because I can point to the code sections of the, of the ordinance requirements. Gotcha. I think the careful part you're gonna run into with a situation, they're, they're gonna be vested in the permit at the time it was issued, so. Um, we, we may have that instance where they're gonna be protected by state law, so I can't ask them for it. That may work, it won't work better going, through, going forward. When I have a grandfathered permit, I can't go back and ask that. Okay, but. So I'm gonna have some conflict with state statute there, but I mean, I, I, that's part of the, the application process, I think we can ask that. Okay. For new ones. And if we if we change it to be more explicit, right. that'll carry that's us from, from now forward. Okay. That seems like a good idea as well. Okay. That those are my ideas. Are are there other items that, that people would like to add to this list? Yes, sir. I think we ought to discuss maybe refinements too or a different method of noise complaint enforcement. State <laughs> it's been my experience and the experience of several people in Germantown that there's either no response or the response comes eight, nine, 10 hours later. So I just don't know if there's a different way to handle that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna open that up. I mean, I know y'all, you can speak to what, what, has, what has held up an environmental court or maybe Mac wants to address how, how, we, how we deal with that now. I think that's a really valid point because it's clearly something we've we've had difficulty making it be effective. Well, the code specifically states that the noise enforcement is handled by the Metro Police Department. It's very specific in that. 
And so, um, and I'll tell you, in my experience, um, and this is anecdotal, but the Metro Police handled this at short-term rentals just as they do at any other property in Metro Nashville. And it's reasonable, it's tried and true method. They go to the property and they ask them to quiet down. If they do so, they virtually never file a report unless there's a drunken disorderly or something else of a different nature at the, at the same time. And if they have to return at that point, they will be more stern in making sure they break up the party and generally will file a report at that time. However, the state law makes it so that an arrest has to be made and the previously described uh, due process has to be played out completely. And so it's, um, there, now I will say this much, we do have many responsible owners of not owner occupied permits that have installed a noise detection system. And if it reaches a certain decibel level, they're notified and they, they reach out. Not everybody, it's expensive, but I've seen that come more and more online. And as more and more come online, the price will correspondingly become more affordable. And so perhaps in the future, we're gonna see that as, uh, as something that's viable. I don't, uh, I don't know, and I haven't really given it a great deal of thought, and I'm not an attorney as to whether or not we can require that for not only occupied permits, but it's definitely something to mull. Um, thank you for raising that question. And, and, and Mr. Herbert, we mulled this, and it's probably been five years ago, if you don't mind bouncing back into that chair and talking about whether we can require, we can't, we can't call out a, a specific company by name, but can we require a noise detection system of some type? I think you could probably legislate it. Um, here's the problem. It's a burden of proof thing when we get into court, and I've seen this over and over again. Um, it's a situation where, uh, let's say that we um, will file a warrant against some entity or somebody for excessive noise. We then have to prove it in court. So how do we prove that? And so typically noise ordinances are set up in decibel levels. You can't exceed 70 decibels at the property line. Let's just say that my property standards inspectors have audiometers or decibel meters or whatever they are yeah and and you get a reading on it the first question that's going to come out of it was on the on the the defense attorney's uh, mouth is going to be so when was that last calibrated um, was it calibrated in accordance with standard weights and measures uh, for the United States and do you have a certificate showing that it was appropriately calibrated okay let's say that by chance we get past that hurdle the next question is going to be that's impossible is Prove to me definitively that every little bit of that noise came from my client's property mm -hmm. and nothing from a passing car or an airplane that went over or a horn or whatever it may be. It's an impossible burden of proof for us. So um, I just had this, council, this, uh, this conversation with council member Stiles, who's looking at the exact same issue with respect to construction noise. So it may be the type of thing where y'all kind of put your heads together and I, th I think I, I told her I think that there's perhaps a better standard than trying to put a decibel level that we can't prove and maybe it's something that's just much more easy plainly audible plainly audible from the property line so I send an inspector by there and if the inspector stands at the property line and says oh I heard it it was plainly audible then my inspector can testify in court wow. I heard it it was plainly audible it violates the law then we got something that we can really do it's very simple but it's effective I think plainly audible is the standard in, in residential areas. It is, but and, and, and it is, it is, but there's also decibel levels associated with excessive noise ordinances, and typically it's 85 decibels. For construction noise, it's 70 decibels, right. but having to prove that decibel level is a, a burden of proof problem for so us. So if, if for the amplified music it's plainly audible at the property line, that may be something we can work with. It, it, it could be. It yeah. could be. All right, okay. we'll keep working on that one. Um, good point. And, and uh, I mean, I guess my question is, if we legislated from here on out that you have to have a noise detection system in any non-owner occupied property, a working one, can we consider the violation if they don't have that? I'm asking the lawyer. Well, a violation from the standpoint, y you've got to look at it through the prism of, are we talking non-conforming or grandfathered permits vis-a-vis -vis those New that ones. do conform? Um, it, you know, it, again, it, it, the, the, the law at the time of the permits issued is, is right. what governs. So yes, for those, as long as there's not a subsequent change of legislation, uh, 
Yes. And okay. So that, that may be a tool we can use for a, n a new subset. I mean, if we had 200 permits issued in the last 30 days, apparently there are still more of these coming. Um, and there's, there's value to trying to deal with, deal with those that are, that are coming. So wh whatever tools we can empower them with. Marilyn. Um, what if there's a preponderance of evidence from ring doorbells that this thing happened? Oh, wow. I'm, I'm just saying, because we had a, a person who was arrested by the FBI on my, on my corner, flashbangs and, and, and all kinds of stuff went on. They did, it was a mess, all right? And the doorbells from six houses down heard it and recorded it. So I don't, you know, I, I mean, I don't know whether that's a, a monkey wrench or <laughs> it's a tool. I don't know. The Can we use ring time. doorbells is the question <laughs> for the lawyers <laughs> in the room. I don't have a good answer. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to say probably not. <laughs> well, no, I would say so too. But there, if all the neighbors have it on tape and everybody says, ah, it didn't happen. <laughs> I don't know what you know, you Maybe it's anecdotally. <laughs> One of the problems we have in enforcement in the environmental court is, you know, we get the complainant, and we, and, and Matt speaks to it too, uh, and they're like, are you willing to testify at court? And we say, no, I'm not going to mm -hmm. not, not do that. You know, that, that hurts us from the standpoint of, of, of being able to convince a judge, judge there's a violation here. Um, I, I think, you know, I think we're, right. we're, we're probably have the same issue with. That's true. Yeah. That's true. We talked I'm about the calibration and how can you prove it with Mozzie? Yeah. yeah. Question? Absolutely. Yes. Um, as we're working oh, through all of these points, kind of going forward, are we able to, is there, uh, have <laughs> access to the data from host yeah. compliance to show us for each of these points, like what, how many complaints were there uh, of this type? And also the breakdown of those 54 under permits, how many are owner occupied versus non owner occupied? So that we know, okay, there were there was one complaint about this. Well, so maybe we focus on the ones we know that we really need to hone in on these that had 50 complaints or whatever that yeah. type. So that we make sure we're spending our time, you know. Great in a point. Great way. point. Um, I would say let's let's uh, and I'm pointing to you, Joey. It, 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 I think we can get data from host compliance. I think we can if you could if you could get us kind of the subset of what you're looking for. Right. Kind of get an active, uh, you know, we, we can get together. I would think this list, I mean, I, th I have A through J right here that we've gone through so far. Um, How many complaints relate to those things? Yeah. Yeah. Specifically. We, we do have the breakdown through host available. In addition to that, as regarding the permits, as far as owner occupied and not owner occupied, IT can provide us with that. They, they, do, they, do, they do so every year when uh, for tax taxation Great. purposes. That would be super helpful. Okay, so if you can get that and, and supply it to me, and then I'll get um, Ms. Hayes to send it out to everybody. That's a that's a really good point. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Jeff and then John. And, and this this may be peripheral to the, to the task group purpose, but I, I do think it would be helpful as we're going through this to think about the interface that neighbors have. That you, know, you get a letter that says that, you know, if you read it, that who you're supposed to contact nine months from now when someone's throwing up in your front yard from the, across the street the, and no one has that letter and the, you're in your bathrobe and trying to figure out what to do to the extent that you know even if the rules don't change there are 10 12 different versions of what's supposed to be able to happen and, and a neighbor's not going to be able to keep up with that but if there's a good way to uh, for for metro to streamline the way that a neighbor can uh, reach out and figure out whether what's happening is appropriate or not, and and provide information and get a get a better understanding of, of that, I think it can do a lot. The, um, even if behavior doesn't change, even if the standards don't change, it can make things. It could take the temperature down, the, or help to gather the information that might not otherwise be out there. For that, us. That's a really good point. I think that and that shows up on Hub Nashville, which hopefully we are all getting trained to to go to, and then also just on the on the codes website, it's fairly easy to to get to the page on short-term rental. So maybe if we can look at those two places and see what's there now, here's a homework assignment for everybody. Go to Hub Nashville and go to the code's website and see what's there now. Um, and then print them out and come back with the markup to the next meeting and let's let's talk about what might be improved there. That's a, that's a really good, really good point. Um, and John. Um, do we have any idea reasonable idea of how many illegal 
units there are and are we obligated to the same process to deal with them as we are legally permitted? That's a, I think that's max, max purview. I'll try not to drag this out too long. Initially, we had a big, big problem with people that came in that knew what they were doing from other cities and had operated in this manner before, and they came in and had no intention of operating according to the law or obtaining permits. That day is long past. Um, our numbers in terms of uh, unpermitted units is are way, way down. The enforcement has been very good, and the ordinance is written in such a manner that all we have to do is prove that they have advertised and operated and in court and the uh, referee in the environmental court has no leeway. He, the ordinance states that it is a three-year injunction, period, final. That they have to wait. That's it. And so that has been a very big incentive for people to act according to the ordinance and to obtain a permit. Now, a big time uh, suck for us is the fraudulently um, obtain owner occupied permits because those are the toughest cases to prove. They are really time consuming. And that's why we were trying to be proactive, uh, especially with this new um, uh, deadline that has just recently occurred and the potential that that presents that we would like to uh, try to get that taken care of prior to it really becoming an issue. But no, the people operating without permits, the numbers are very, very low, and it's very easy to catch them, and it's very easy to prosecute them. That's one piece of good news. Runs with the dirt. That's beautiful. One more question. And, and kind of picking up on, on Jeff's thing, is it possible to create a database that's accessible to the public that has the name and the contact information of the person that you're required to put on the permit application. This is, this is the person who lives within 25 miles of this property. So if I have a problem next door, I could go to this database and I could call that person and say, you have a problem over here. You need to come take care of it. I, I believe that data is currently available mm -hmm. uh, on our website. Now it may not be simple to get to, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm 99% certain that the permit itself, the documents they've submitted are there. I'll let the... Uh, Super fast. Um, um, IT, ITS and the GIS division has created a map that's currently available on our website and you can click on it. It shows every single short-term rental that has an active permit within the county. You can click on the little dot on the map. It'll give you every piece of information that we've obtained about it. So who the contact is, who the owner is, every single thing, every little piece of information is there. Great. So we yeah. just need so to let people to know that. that. We need to get that link to you. That'd be great. That should be on the letter that, that goes out as well. That's that's good information. All right, we are nearing, we have passed our end, end point, and, but we're almost through. Um, so I want to recognize Councilmember Parker, and then, and then we'll talk about methods and goals real quick, and then we're done. Councilmember Parker. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to speak to something that we touched on, which is, um, you know, refining mechanisms for proving owner occupancy and you know right now that that letter goes out um, I, I don't remember the exact language that's in the letter but I, I think we would really benefit from there being clear language in there that a layperson would understand about what the requirements are um, for the applicant that you know they do it is their domicile it is actually their their home that they occupy um, and then also sort of formalizing that process of, you know, having an opportunity for neighbors to give feedback um, because right now it just sort of happens, like as a district council member, you know, I get emails and calls all the time from people who say, hey, I got a letter, you know, this house just sold two weeks ago and like nobody's been here. Um, they came in and parked furniture and they haven't been back since. So, you know, I'm getting direct feedback from a neighbor that, you know, nobody lives here and um, they've applied for an owner-occupied permit and so the number of times that, you know, someone savvy enough about the language and the jargon we use interprets that letter and then understands that they need to call their Metro Council member, you know, that's a, that's, um, uh, that's a tip of the iceberg type situation. There's a lot more of it happening where, again, if neighbors were getting something in plain English, 
layperson understandable. I think that we'd, we'd be able to get at least some feedback from people about some of those um, potentially false um, owner-occupied applica permit applications that are, that are coming in. And of course, with any of this stuff, you know, it's always a balance. We want to be careful to not turn neighbors into enforcers and inspectors of their neighbors. But I do think that we can do something to make that process um, uh, better and, and clearer to neighbors. Good point, good point, thank you. Um, well, we've got, we've got an ambitious list here, um, but I, I think this group can do it. So I'm, I'm excited that we've, that we've taken it on. What, uh, what I've asked us to do is um, kind of real quickly talk through what we think our method should be for getting some legislation drafted. And then um, I think we need to meet at least two more times probably, maybe more, I don't know. Um, so do we want to meet uh, in two weeks, in a month, um, and what are our goals for that next meeting? So I guess my first big question would be, um, uh, I, I don't want to encroach too much on your time, but would this group be willing to reconvene, say, in, in two weeks and have done some homework and made some progress? Does that seem like a reasonable time frame? Um, are Tuesdays as good as anything? Is coming down to the courthouse a terrible thing? We did this um, because when Councilmember Parker and I are in the same room, it has to be recorded and publicly noticed, and it's so much easier for IT to do the wonderful job they're doing if we're here in the courthouse. Um, we do have a bill coming up that will enable us to pay you back for your parking, but it, it hasn't passed yet, but <laughs> we're working on it. Um, so if, it, if, if, the, if this group can handle coming down here and two weeks from now works, um, let's let's think towards that. I'll I'll confirm, um, and Ms. Hayes can check and see if this room would be available to us. But we'll we'll tentatively set it from two weeks two weeks from now. Is is six o'clock good, or would five be better, or seven be better? Any six is okay. All right. So let's 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 tentatively set it for two weeks, same time, same place. It hope you guys can be here. Thank you so much. Okay. You said Tuesday, so you meant did you mean? Is today Wednesday? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. I mean Wednesdays. Is, or if Wednesdays work, yeah, let's stick with Wednesdays. Okay. 6 p.m. Awesome. That, that's good. Um, so in terms of our goal, I have now 13 items that we've come up with. That's a lot. Um, I, would, I, would, I, would, I know that by the time we get back, it would be great if um, we've gotten the information from host compliance. Um, it would be great maybe if y'all have language you like already for the ownership things and the curtailment things, if you can provide those to us. Um, and if anyone, we, I mean, we can work with uh, the lawyers amongst us to begin to draft legislation on all this and send it out to people or if people feel compelled to come up with your own suggestions for language, we'll have to run it past lawyers. What, what seems like the best way to move forward with that? Let the lawyers do it. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, um, then, then I will say, Council Member Parker and I may divide and conquer um, and, and think our ways through and work with the lawyers that have joined us here to try to come up with as many things as makes sense. Some of these are not legislative, but most of them do seem to be. Some of them, as I have said, involve everyone going to look at the website and to Hub Nashville and, and come up with your suggestions. I would love for a couple of people to think about a template for what that notification letter should look like. Is there is there currently a template? I know in my mind I have written one, but I can't remember if it ever made its way officially onto the code's website. Oh, good. Gotcha. Okay, so we need to look at that template. Thank you for letting us know that. Um, we can we can find that that template and look at that, and then and again also possibly mark that up. Are you going to redraft this and add these points that you? Added yes, I will. I will that? send out uh, some some form of minutes that will have all of these on there, um, so that we can then do that and. Um, and try to reiterate homework assignments. And so I'd, I would say that our goal will be for the next meeting to come back with um, comments on the website, comments on Hub Nashville, comments on that template letter, 
Um, that would be great. Um, and then possibly, uh, possibly some uh, proposed draft legislation for the, for the key items here, as many as we can get to. That's a worthy goal. Um, does that sound good? And um, hopefully we will be joined by a, a few more neighbors. I feel, I feel like the owners are well represented. I hope y'all feel well represented. And I appreciate that um, and the realtors. Um, and Jeff, you did a good job of speaking for the neighbors, but we'll get, get you some company there. Um, any other suggestions on, on how best to prepare for a meeting two weeks from now? Jeff. It might also be really helpful to get a copy of the TCA provisions that okay. draw the line of what what's grandfathered in and what are the things that, that are not, just so we're not wasting our time by uh, thinking that things will be applicable that might not or, right. or misunderstanding where right. that line exists. And I did, I didn't mention it or, or bring it up, but I did um, provide uh, at, at the seats the kind of excerpts of Metro code. As, as we've mentioned, this is kind of wonky, but it, it now lives in two sections. One is in section six, which deals with businesses and things like that. And then 17 is the zoning code. Um, and being in those different sections means it means different things, which is um, something that the lawyers have brought up. So um, study that as well, I guess, so that you can know what the, what the latest and greatest versions of what is in there um, is. And Mac, do you have one more thing you want to? Yes, our uh, Nashville.gov website has been revamped. And so you may have had familiarity with it previously, but if you would like to check out uh, all, all information that is on the website concerning short-term rental properties, you simply go to Nashville.gov, go to Departments, and then go to Codes and Building Safety. Codes and Building Safety. Okay, and it's, you know, it's now in those boxes and things. But there's also a great navigation tool in the upper left-hand corner, sort of, that I, I have an easier time finding things there. So we can send out links as well. Would it be possible to send um, the draft of some of this legislation prior to the meeting in two weeks so that we could have some time to review it and just be a little bit more familiar with it and bring comments to the meeting? Yes, let me let me check with lawyers in the room. Um, again, Councilmember Parker and I cannot discuss legislation except in public settings. Okay. Um, but I believe if Ms. Hayes sends it to all of y'all um, and we're not copied on it at the same time, then we can do that. Does that, does that sound right? Lawyers in the room. Um, I mean, sunshine laws are great things, and we, we respect that and want to and want to do it right. But it's I mean, y'all can talk to us, and y'all can talk to him, but he and I can't talk to each other. So as long as as we're cognizant of what's allowed, um, then I think that's that's a great suggestion. Um, so that being said, um, we'll try. To, it's, we're meeting on Wednesday. We'll try to have that two people the Friday before we meet again. Because what else are you going to be doing on the, on the weekend, um, so that people have had an opportunity to to look at it? Does that sound like that sound like a plan? Great. Anything else? I think we're I think we're set. All right. We we ran a little bit over, but I think that's still pretty good. We were under an hour and a half. Um, so I'm going to um, thank you all for coming and uh, make sure you signed in. So I've got your contact information, and I, I think we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, IT.